today, the, 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 the title is Prayer Answer. And we're going to, over the next little while, we're going to look at how God answered prayer in the lives of individuals in the Bible. But just as a quick review, as we were started off this entire series, we dealt with in week one, we dealt with the thought, what is prayer? And I said this about prayer. I said, prayer is a relationship wherein we humbly communicate, worship, and sincerely seek God's face. Knowing that He hears us, loves us, and will respond, though not always in a manner we may expect or desire. And we shared what all that meant. And the second week, we dealt with the purpose of prayer. And we said prayer is a privilege that God gives us where we He lets us participate in His will being accomplished on earth. So we have, we have the privilege to participate in His story. And then week three, we dealt with why I pray. And I said prayer is a two-way conversation with God. Why I pray? The simple answer is this. Jesus did. fact is, what uh, Cindy read this morning, she talked about when He sent the disciples away, after the feeding of the 5,000, what did he do? He draw him, he sent him across the lake, and he drawed himself a what to do what? He drawed himself away to do what? To pray. So Jesus prayed. And then we looked through, then we begin to look at the word pray and broke it down into an acronym, which meant praise, repent, ask, and yield. And we dealt with each one of those. And I said, this, these show us a simple framework for prayer that Jesus gave us so that we can keep our prayers fresh and growing. But the best prayer lesson of all can be summed up in the self-slogan of Nike. Just do it. So when we looked at those, we looked at praise. When we looked at praise, I said this. I said, God is so awesome, He deserves our praise. God is praised for who He is and all that He does. And then we looked at repent. And we said repentance results in God's Forgiveness. And with that, we looked at the portion of the Lord's Prayer which said, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I showed you how that goes hand in hand, how that ties in, where we must have a forgiving spirit ourselves. But again, you want to know more about that? You can look it up online. Then we dealt with letter A, ask. We said, God wants to hear our heart's desire. He longs for you to talk to Him. He longs for you to pour your heart out before Him. And we said, give us this day our daily bread. We tied that in. And then the last, when I, the last time I was speaking to you guys, we dealt with the letter Y. And we talked about yield. And I said, yield means to let God be God. And I tell you, and if that one didn't sink in, you need to let it sink in. There's times in our life, a good place, we just need to let God be God. Just to say, God, I'm letting go of the reins. That sort of ties in. We've been watching a show called Heartland lately. It's a lot about horses. So when I say, letting go of the reins, I'm, I'm beginning to understand. I know nothing all about horses. All about I know about horses, I teach on this show. But, uh, we need to let go of the ring. We need to let go of the steering wheel. You know, what's that, what's that song that uh, Carrie Edwards said? Jesus, take the wheel! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Of course, you know that I, I did that purposefully. I, I did not really try to sing that because I can't sing it. But we have to yield. We have to. Um, yield means to let God be God. And then I said this pretty much every week. I said to talk about prayer or even study prayer is no substitute for actually talking to God or actually praying. Because Jesus did not use the expression, if you pray, He said, when you pray. And in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, this is what we read. It says, Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as He finished, one of His disciples came to Him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught His disciples. And Jesus said to them, this is how you should. Jesus prayed. His disciples saw how important it was. And they even what they asked Jesus would teach us how to pray. And, if, and if these ones who literally hung out in the physical presence of the Son of God asked the Son of God to teach them how to pray, how much more do we need to say, Lord, teach us to pray. Give us a burden to have prayer a, a major part of our life. Yes, I know, I know we can say we can feel his presence, but again, could you just imagine what it would have been like to truly be been to be around with Jesus, to be one of those twelve to spend three years every day and every night with him. And literally see the mind blowing things that well to see the mind blowing things that he did and hear the mind blowing things that he spoke. 
And we know there were mine homes many times, they, they would go, uh, uh, wait a second, well, what? <laughs> um, e e either freak them out and say, well, we've always heard death and Jesus would correct them. Or they say, you know, what in the world are you talking about? And when they said that, again, this goes to show, if you don't understand something, God will explain that Jesus would then take the time and do what? Explain to them what he meant. Oh, there's, there's so much you can get out of this. I'm just really, really understand this, you know. Understand what God is really making a with you. So that being said, he said, pray this. He said, as we said, this isn't the only prayer we pray. This, this is what we use as our model prayer. Right? So let's go ahead and pull this up and let's let's say this prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. His is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And with all of that, when we did the acronym, I hand you out these little cards I thought you can hang on to or take a picture on your smartphone and keep it so it sort of has an acronym for you. It breaks down the Lord's Prayer for you so you know different things to pray about it. About the, about the praise, ask. Uh, the praise, repent, ask, and, and yield. It's all on there. If you don't have it, and I still have some up here, you're more than welcome to get them at the service. So we dealt with that over the last little while. And then we got done with this. So, Lord, you know, I really don't necessarily want to, want to, want to end with this, but I think we really need to look at some prayers in the Bible. Look at some people who prayed some prayers and what happened. So, so this next little while, we're going to be looking at the thought process, prayer, answer. And I have this as if, if you are praying, it's probably because you want something to change. Am I right? Usually, uh, you know, usually the only time we really pray is when we want God to do something. So when you pray for a blessing, you want to feel blessed afterwards. Right? I mean, common sense. When you pray for protection, you want to feel safe afterwards. When you pray for deliverance, you want your problems to go away as soon as possible. You know, a lot of times we'll, we'll pray to God and we want to put a little hashtag on it. ASAP. <laughs> You need to do it for that when you're going to pray. So before you say amen, say, hashtag ASAP, Lord. <laughs> Not saying you're going to listen to that, but hey, just, yeah. Just, okay. But we do. We were in a place where we just really, we really want him to just, we want to answer it as soon as possible. But if change doesn't happen, or if change doesn't happen like you think it should, we could conclude that praying doesn't really work. And I believe that's probably why God has so many stories in the Bible of prayers being answered. People that they, they beseech God for Him to intercede in their messy lives, and you know what? He did. When they, when they sought after Him, He did. So as we look at some of these incredible stories about answered prayers, I want you to notice two important aspects. Number one, the attitude and the motives of the person who prayed. And when you look at their, their attitude and the motives of the person who prayed. And then number two, the power with which God answered prayer. And see, when I say number two, that number two should get you excited. Because we are, in the next little while, we're going to deal with about ten different stories of Prayer. I don't know if I'm going to do it for 10 weeks or combine some of that. I, I don't quite know exactly how that's going to lay out. I know today we're dealing with one. Um, but there's going to be about 10 stories I'm going to bring out to you of answered prayers in the Bible. But I want you to understand each time we do this, I want you to notice the power with which God answered. These stories could change the way you pray and change how your prayers get answered as we go through this. The first one we're going to look at today is, is about a woman named Hannah. Hannah isn't mentioned a lot in the Bible, but her story is very, very important because uh, it teaches us a lot of important lessons that we can learn about how she prayed. Hannah was one of two wives married to 
of Haina. The first one's name was Panina. Oh, no, no, well, Panina, Panina, Panina. Uh, Elkanah's other wife was able to have children while Hannah was unable to. <clears throat> now, in the Jewish culture, a woman was valued heavily when they were able to bear children. In other words, it, 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 their value was, was very heavily tied to the fact of whether or not they could have children or not. Especially if they were to have male children. Because it would carry on the family lineage. Uh, but to make matters even worse for her, her rival would basically mock her every time that she would go to worship, or she would try to go to church, her, her, her rival would mock her each and every time in such a way that it messed up Hannah so much that she, it almost gave her an inability to where she couldn't really focus on God, to where she just sort of gave up and didn't even, even uh, worship. So you can imagine that Hannah was heartbroken. The Bible describes how she went days weeping and choosing not to eat. You know, I want you to really picture this for a minute. Can you imagine the humility and the shame that Hannah must have felt? I mean, she couldn't even attend church at all without um, being ridiculed because her her rival wife would just would just mess with her. But I want to real quick read you this account of of Hannah, and we're going to dive into what we can learn from this this morning. In First Samuel. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 28. This is what we read. It says, Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Peniah. Peniah had children, but Hannah did not. Each year, Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to Peniah and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give only one choice portion because the Lord had not give, had given her no children. So Peniah, Peniah would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. So again, how this happened? What? For a long period of time, year after year, it was the same. Peninnah would talk to Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah asked her. Why aren't you eating? Why, why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having one son? Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you and he will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he's been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. And as she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Seeing her lips moving, but hearing no sound, he thought that she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk? He demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I'm very discouraged. And I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked, asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. And then she went back, began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. I'm going to stop there just one second. We never know who God is placing in our lives. And when we have a chance to speak a word of encouragement to build them up, that's what we need to do. We need to give them words of encouragement. And that's literally what happened to Hannah here. The high priest spoke a word of encouragement. Think, you think, in, in her understanding, once the high priest spoke that, that the Lord answered your prayer, she knew right then, because the high priest said the Lord answered your prayer, what was going to happen? The Lord was going to answer her prayer. So again, that's why she began to eat again. She was no longer sad. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. 
Then, then they returned home to Ramah. And when Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea. And in due time she gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. The next year, Elkanah and his family went on their annual trip to offer sacrifice to the Lord and to keep his vow. But Hannah did not go. She told her husband, wait until the boy is weaned. And then I will take him to the tabernacle and leave him there with the Lord permanently. Whatever you think is best, Elkanah agreed. Stay here for now, and may the Lord help you keep your promise. So she stayed home and nursed the boy until he was weaned. And when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh and, and brought along a three-year-old bull for the, for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine. After sacrificing the bull... They brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I am the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked him to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I am giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worship the Lord there. Now, when, you know, I'm, I'm going to touch on things in a second, but you know, when we read this, Hannah wasn't really just making a deal with God. And many times we can, when we read this, we say, okay, well, maybe, maybe if I say, uh, deal or no deal, God. You know, how many of you remember that, that, that game show with the briefcases? Pick out a number, and how it would sit there after they go through this stuff, or briefcases from like a dollar or a penny, whatever it was, up to a million. And, and, and you could call it the briefcase, and, uh, and they would open it up and see what you had left. And then the banker would give you an offer. And you could decide to take the offer or keep on going, trying to get the highest dollar prize that's left in the suitcases. And when you find it, and Howie would always ask him, deal or no deal? Yeah. You know? yeah. And sometimes, you know, if we read this, we can sort of get the misconception that, that, that Hannah was trying to, 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 to strike a deal with God. Mm. And as we get into this, I'm going to show you later on that, that I don't really believe that's what she was, she was doing. Okay? But one thing we do know, her prayer was very, very effective because why? When Eli said it, God got to God, remembered her prayer, and answered her prayer, and all of a sudden Samuel came. But again, you know, when we read this, we sit there and think, remember, she offered, she said, Lord, if you give me this child, I will dedicate it to you, and he will serve at the tabernacle all of his life. So think about this. When, when he was probably about anywhere from three to maybe seven years old, I'm not sure exactly how old he would have been. Hannah took him, as we spread through that, took him to Eli and said, this is the child I've been praying about. And I told God I would give him to him. So I'm leaving him here with you. And he's to live with you and to live in this tabernacle and minister to the Lord for the rest of his life. She worshiped and she left and went home and left her son there. Think about that. Let this sink in. Think about that. That's what she did. But because of that, I want to read to you something I've written down here. And I said this, I said, sure enough, Samuel became the greatest prophet in Israel's history. Who maintained direct communication with God throughout his life. He also was the one who anointed the first two kings of Israel. But in addition to Samuel, because of Hannah's willingness to truly be obedient to God, God gave Hannah three more sons and two more daughters. She went from being barren to being plumped because she knew who her God was. When we are willing to give our best to God, God blesses us with more. Did you hear me? When we are willing to give our best to God, God blesses us with more. But before I explain some important things that we can learn from your story, I want to ask you a question. Do you believe prayer actually works? We talk a lot about praying as Christians. But the honest truth is that the reason why many Christians don't pray enough is because they really don't believe that it works. But let me ask this question. Why do we drink water? 
It's a simple question with a very obvious answer, all right? Why do we drink water? <laughs> we never hesitate to miss drinking water on a daily basis unless we can't help it. Why do we eat food? However, when it comes to our spiritual life and prayer, a lot of times we look at that, well, that's a completely different story. And I'm going to pause there for a second. For those of you on Tuesday nights, get ready. To, there, there, there's a quick little series that's going to be coming up to sort of tie in with this. Um, dealing with bread, water, bread, and how often. Oh, you just have to wait to, to get there. It's just a little bit of a, a just, just, to just be just be ready for that. And I'm telling you, some of these things we're doing on Tuesday nights, if you have, I'm telling you, you need to come. I'm telling you, your mind will be blown on a lot of stuff. Like that. And uh, so, so just, just, just be, uh, be, be ready for that. Um, but you know, a lot of times when it comes to our spiritual life, we look at it a little bit differently. Do you really, do you really believe prayer actually works? And this is something you get straight if you want things to change. Okay, so, so that's something that you need to think about. You need to say, God, if you don't, you need to say, God, if you can move my life where I can truly understand that, that prayer really works, that, that it's real. But there are three important things that we can learn about Hannah's prayer. And the first one is this. Pray with all your heart. Pray with all your heart. Hannah prayed with all her heart. The Bible tells about how she prayed with deep anguish, getting down on her knees, giving all of herself in prayer. It sort of reminds me of David when he writes the, the, the psalms that he wrote. And many times you, you can literally feel his cries and his emotions that he had in his prayers that, that he made in the psalms. Uh, because again, some of the greatest psalms that are out there, a lot of times you for encouragement, they came from David, from when he's going through trials and tribulations, but yet he kept his eyes and his faith in God. But pray with all your heart. And I want to ask you this, when is the last time you prayed with you? When is the last time you prayed with everything that is in you? See, we can't be passive, unemotional, dry, routine prayer robots. It's not about just memorizing the Lord's Prayer and just repeat it every single time you sort of feel something go wrong. It's where you look at it, where you look at it more as a good luck charm. It's about truly praying with everything that is in you, praying with all your heart. We need to revive our prayer life and pray that God will answer our prayers at any moment. See, you, you get to a state of expectation. When you begin to read, and that's why it's so important to read His Word and see how God moved in the lives of individuals. When you begin to see the mess that happened in there, you know, if you think your life is messed up, man, if you haven't read the Bible, there's some messed up lives in the Bible, and God used them anyway. God used them mightily anyway. But He helped change their messed up lives. It's like when we read this, we read this story here about Hannah. And Medea and Otina. I think of Jacob. His two wives and two concubine wives. Man, there was mess there. You get the twelve, the twelve patriarchs of Israel. A lot of stuff went on. But in spite of their stupidity, God still got his will done. And that should encourage you to understand that God can answer prayer like at any moment. Sometimes the, the prayer may be answered instantly because I have seen instant healings. Again, you know, I would love to see the type of healing that Michael Rome was talking about several years ago when he was talking about, about the little evangelist woman who was traveling around the countryside in Vietnam and she was praying for people and she had, she had like an army of 10,000 people backing her up in prayer and she went to this village that was completely, completely godless 
And, and it, before she started, they, they said, wait a second, if you're God's God, how can you show that it's God? And this person who didn't have, a, it was either an arm or a leg, came out, she began to pray for that person, and in front of the entire village, it grew out. I'm like, what? Again, you hear about those kind of reports all the time coming from what we say, third world countries, from backward countries. And last time they said, well, Pastor, why are we seeing the United States? Well, I guess the question is, are we truly praying with all our hearts? Are we expecting God to truly answer at any moment? And I know He can. I've had God answer, not quite that way, but I've had God answer prayers that we prayed over people when they come up for certain things and they've gone, they've gone back and all of a sudden the doctor told them, hey, what? I don't, I don't understand this. God, He does answer prayer, but we have to pray with all of our hearts. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this. Pray for the right reason. And I will say, in all honesty, it's probably where we fall the most. That's where we um, fall short the most. See, Hannah was diligent in her prayer life, but she likely was, was praying to have her needs met more than anything. See, initially, she probably started out praying the wrong way. Uh, we have to understand that our prayer life isn't about us. You've heard me say this lots of times. It's not about us. It's about who? It's about God. It's about, it's about Him. I think Hannah's attitude and subsequently her prayer like, had gradually changed from her praying like this, God, please give me a baby so I don't have to experience the pain and humiliation that I'm in. Or, I want a child so badly for myself. Instead, her prayers changed to, God, you know the deep desire I have for a child. You have seen my pain that I'm experiencing because of this. Despite of all of this, though, I pray that if you do give me a child, I will have this child to glorify you. Let's, again, if we look at it, it's about giving him the glory. I know that what you think about me is far more important than what others say or do to me. See, we have to get to a place. And we told that everything we do, we need to do it to bring honor and glory to God. This Christian walk. Again, I can't stress this enough to you. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Him. And when we truly get Him in center focus, everything about me will be taken care of. See, that's where we have the hardest time to understand that. Because we're taught so many times, if we don't take care of ourselves, who else will? I mean, think about it. Isn't that what we've sort of been taught through life? If you don't take care of it yourself, who else will? I mean, especially once you get to a certain age in life. You know, when you're younger, we always expect mom and dad, grandma and granddad to come to the rescue and take care of it for us. But many times, because of this, is what, what, what human nature tells us, that if we don't take care of me, who else is going to? That's why we always put me first in this stuff. But yet, like I said, the kingdom turns things upside down. Any type of natural thing we have, the kingdom turns it upside down. I was just talking to somebody. Um, I think it might have been shown for sure. I'm talking about, um, um, I was talking to somebody about how God's, yes, God's finances, scriptural finances, biblical finances, make no sense to the world. How can you give away 10% of something and get more in return? And your 90% goes farther than your 100%. Humanly speaking, that makes no sense. But spiritually speaking, it works. Because you're not making it about you, you're making it about Him. And when you make it about Him, you are taking care of it. That's why it's so important. You need to understand it's about Him. When you make Him first place, everything else in your life, everything else about you is taken care of because you're close to the one who is all things. Are you understanding this? Morning? And that's where the devil is very good at trying to get us to keep the focus on me. 
And God all the while is telling you, just look to me. Just trust in me. Otherwise, just keep your focus on me, not on you, on me. And then I will take care of the rest. I said, pray for the right reason. Understand, it's not about you, but it's about him. See, my guess is that God gave her a child, but her heart and her prayers align more with his. In the same way, make sure that your prayers are ultimately about God and not for your own selfish reasons. So we have pray with all your heart, pray for the right reasons. And then here comes number three, which is the tough one. Be patient. Don't you love that word? Don't you love that word? Patience. Two wonderful words. Be patient. And realize that God may take a while to answer your prayer. Understand that whatever you are praying about may not be answered for a long time. I know that can be very, very frustrating to hear. But it's the truth. Because as we see here, how many, how many of y'all think that, that the only time Hannah prayed about this? How many of y'all think that the only time Hannah prayed about this was when she went to the tabernacle that one day when, when she was praying with just her lips moving and Eli saw her? Do you think that was probably the first and only time she prayed about this? If you think so, raise your hand. Again, we know that if this might be the only time that it was recorded. But we know year after year after year after year, Hanina ridiculed her, made fun of her. So much so that, that she allowed to impact her so much that she basically lost all joy and she couldn't even worship God in a time where God said, this is the time for you to come with a joyful worship before me. And she couldn't. How many times do I bet that she, she prayed? For, for, for God to let her have a child. But like I said, there was something that was different about the time she got to a place where she said, Lord, if you do this, you know, she says, you know, you know, just let it be done. And, and, and he's going to be yours. And you can use him for your honor, for your glory. And when she truly got to a place where it was about truly, because honestly, Samuel glorified God in his life because his mom was willing to say, Lord, I will give him completely to you. And you can, sometimes parents, we need to be willing to do that with our kids. Whether they're serving God or not. And that God come in and move and do things in their life. She had to wait patiently for God to answer. Even though God may not answer your prayer right away, He is still with you. He is still guiding you every step of the way. And His love for you is never ending. This sort of goes into another one thing when I said prayer is. The very first one we said in the problem of what is prayer. See, Hannah's story is one that we can easily identify with. We can identify with her pain and struggles of being humiliated, waiting a long time for an answer to a specific prayer and her deep desire for something that she wanted so badly. We get that. And I hope that you learn from Hannah's story how a reevaluation of your prayer life might be the very thing you need to unlock God's blessings upon us. About understanding, we need to pray with all of our heart. We need to pray for the right reasons. And we need to be patient. So in closing today, I want to close with just a couple portions of scripture which we dealt with in our letter A and ask to just help reinforce this and help encourage you to, to never stop asking God to understand because if he answered the prayer of Hannah, we begin to understand the Bible says that God is no respecter of a person. If God answered Hannah's prayer, you know what? He will answer your prayer.
God has answered my prayer, guess what? He will answer your prayer. If God has answered your prayer, guess what? He will answer my prayer. But I need to understand, I need to pray with all my heart. I need to pray for the right reasons. I need to be with that being said, I'll share these portions of Scripture with you. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, we read, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Pray about what? Everything. Everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. You notice I have it highlighted behind me. Then, you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind, minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So again, we're being encouraged to pray. But again, pray for everything. Pray, pray, pray about everything. We're, we're given that right to do that. And plus, give Him the glory. Philippians 4.19 tells us. Paul shares, he says, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from His glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. You notice how it all focuses on who? On Jesus. He paid it all, folks. He paid it all. I was just sharing with Wanda the other day. I said, I know it's not, I know it's not this way. I said, but I said, I don't think it's this way. I said, the thought I was having was, how you know uh, we know that when Christ was hanging on the cross and you know that He said, "Lord, oh, remember, remember me," and you know when you your kingdom and, and and all this, you know. Of course, we know the cross is where Christ paid the price. And I was telling her something about how you know God, you know, when I explain it, you know, past, present, and future are all now to God. You know, it's like He's it, it's all there. It's all it's all like present to Him. And I sort of wonder, you know, when the reason why His grace is so wonderful. Is that whenever we go to him in forgiveness, for forgiveness, him, him seeing, him seeing his son dying, and we really look at Christ, at Christ. But but the fact that Jesus died on the cross, that that right then is immediately present to him. And if that is the case, no wonder his grace is so wonderful. Because when we say, "Lord, forgive me," in the name of Jesus. All of a sudden, it's like Jesus is there on the cross. We know we did it 2,000 years ago, but again, you gotta, again, I, I need you to step out of your human thinking here and start to put on the impossibility of who God is. You're the same God as I shared with you. God, how, how, how He can carry on con how He can carry on conversation with seven and a half million people at the same time, and yet give 100% attention to every single one. Can you do that? Who here can carry on two conversations and give 100% attention to each person you're talking to? Can you do that? But God can do it seven and a half, million, seven and a half billion times over, and then however many more are going to be born, He can do it that many more. And yet still, not anything that's happening in the universe escapes His knowledge or His attention. Can you say, oh, what a powerful God we serve. So because of Jesus, we, we, can, we can pray for all this stuff. Mark 11, 24 says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. If you believe that you have received it, it will be yours. And then Jesus himself, he tells us again in Matthew, he tells us this in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 8. He says, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Hence, as I share with you in that message, you take ask, seek, knock. With the first letters, what does it say? Ask. So as that musician can come and take their place, I'm going to end with these thoughts right here, which I shared on that day also. We have to get to a point where we truly take Jesus at his word. He said it, and you know what? I believe. Learn that when he says something, it happens. 
It may not be right away or exactly when you want it to happen, but in God's time, hence being patient, it does happen. So when he says we're forgiven, let's unload the guilt. Let's let it go. When he says you're valuable, let's believe him. When he says you're provided for, let's stop worrying. And when he says come to him in prayer about all things, big or small, trust him and pray. But again, as we learned from Hannah today, the three important things are pray with all your heart, pray for the right reasons, and be patient. And we're encouraged time and time again in the Word to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray, to ask, seek, and knock. Let me ask you a question. Who here ever has, a, you know, solicitors come to your door? And you I ring the doorbell and you say, you know what? I'm not gonna answer. So you let the doorbell ring and you sort of ignore it, right? You let them ring it again and you ignore it. Let me ask you a question. If they just kept on ringing, what would you do? You would probably try to find a way to either unplug the, the doorbell or if you didn't have the doorbell, all they do is just turn knock on the door. Watch your gun and shoot him in the face. <laughs> what do you think you would eventually do? How many of you would, would eventually answer the door? Because you want to say, Would you stop? <laughs> what do you want? I mean, let's do Am I right? What would we, we do that? If someone's constantly just knocking on the door, odds are you would what? Eventually open that door and say, what are you doing? Or what do you want? So I'm saying that, keep on knocking. We would eventually answer the door. So without the difference is he's not going to answer in an irritated way. Because he out here is the cat. I'm answer. Because he used that same thing talking about the unjust judge. About how the widow went before him, and day after day pleaded. Avenge me, my enemy. Avenge my enemy. He finally said, You know what? I don't fear God, I don't fear anybody, but you know what? This one's getting my nerves. So I'm going I'm to avenge you. And he says, Do you hear the unjust judge? See how he brought justice to her. He says, And will not your heavenly father do the same if you continue to keep on asking? See, but God wants us to keep on asking. And he doesn't get irritated about it. Hence, Jesus said, Ask, see, and not keep on doing it, and you will get your answer. Don't get weary. Pray with all your heart. Pray for the right reasons. And be patient. Keep on seeking his face. Like I said, over the last little while, this is the most important time of the service. Because this is the time. Well, I want to encourage you to everything we've dealt with so far about pray, praise, repent, ask, give, about what prayer is, why we pray, the purpose of prayer. These these three lessons we learn about hands about answer prayer. Prayer means this is a time when we begin to put it in practice. But I don't want you to just put it in practice when you just come up here today. This is something. You need to put in practice for the rest of your life. And I want to tell you, he is a prayer answering God. So what is it you need to pour out your whole heart before God? What is it that maybe you need to start truly praying with the right reasons for it? 
what is it you need to truly be patient about it? just God be God because as we deal with the yield yield means to let God be God there's one thing I can tell you throughout, again, throughout the word time and time again you see that God answers prayer and if he answered it for them and standing on what his word says he's no respecter of person he will answer for you so what's the Lord trying to say to you? How's He trying to direct your prayer this morning? Because I truly believe you can leave this place different than you can. And it's not because of the message I preach. It's not because of anything of who I am. But it's because of the one I serve and the word that He gave me to the prayer of I do not believe it's by mistake this word was spoken today. I truly do believe that all my steps and what I say is for of God. And you're here this morning for a reason. The question is, what are you going to do with what He declared to you today in this service? He's ready for you. He's waiting. It's up to you to step forward. I'm not sure exactly what you need maybe today, but I'm here to tell you, He is a prayer entering God. You, you know, I said many of us can relate, or all of us really can relate to the story of Hannah. We may have felt humiliated, dejected, and everything else. But I'm here to tell you, he's still the God that connects you up. And that's what he did for him, and he can do it for you. But again, what? Well, we've got to pray for all of our hearts. We've got to pray for the right reason. And we've got to be patient. Just keep our eyes upon him. Realize it's about him. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to end. We're going to, end. We're going to sing this song here. Our God. And as we sing this song, which understand truly what this course says. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you're higher than any other. Our God is healer. He's awesome in power. Our God. If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Who could ever stop us? No one. Because our God is an awesome God. And as we can declare this song, whatever you need, I'm going to step out of faith believe it. You need to seek His face. You need to pour out all your heart before Him. Make sure, say, Lord, help make sure my motives are right, Lord, that I realize it's about bringing glory to You. And Lord, I'll be as patient as You need me to be because I know You are a prayer answering God. Amen.